Hi everyone, my name is Chelsea Gardner and I'm an archeologist specializing in ancient Greece and an associate professor of ancient history at Acadia University in Wolfville, Nova Scotia, Canada. Welcome to Peopling the Past. What topic are you talking about today? Today, I'm going to take you on a journey to the end of the world and talk to you about the sanctuary of Poseidon at the site of ancient Tyneron in the Mani Peninsula. Now, before we start talking about the sanctuary itself, I do have to tell you a bit more about where it's located. The Mani Peninsula is the middle of three projections off of the southern Peloponnese in Laconia, Greece. And the site of Tyneron is at the very southern tip of this peninsula. That makes it the southernmost point in the Greek mainland, the second southernmost point in mainland Europe. And let me tell you, it really feels like the end of the world. When you stand here at the edge of the Mediterranean Sea and look out, the water unfolds for 400 kilometers until the shores of northern Libya. It must have felt this way to the ancient Greeks and Romans as well, since Tyneron is maybe most famous for being the mythological entrance to the underworld. It is this very spot where Heracles himself descended to retrieve the famous three-headed dog Cerberus. Because Tyneron felt like the end of the world, it was also often used to delineate and describe the physical geographic limits of the ancient world. So ancient geographers and writers would talk about it as if it was the end of the earth. And, you know, of course, a place that was the entrance to Hades certainly served as a liminal place, a threshold between the land of the living and the land of the dead. But... There's more to Tyneron than this alluring, mysterious role. And getting away from the mythology can actually tell us more about the real people who visited this place in antiquity. For example, Tyneron served as the location for enormous gatherings of mercenaries looking to be hired out in the tumultuous decades after the death of Alexander the Great. There are also several marble quarries for black and red marbles that are located on and near this promontory. And these marbles were exported throughout the Mediterranean. And what I'm gonna talk about in more detail today, the sanctuary of Poseidon served as a place of refuge and asylum for those who had nowhere else to turn. What sources or data do you look at? When trying to understand the activities that took place at Tyneron throughout antiquity, I use anything and everything I can get my hands on. Literary sources span over a thousand years and mention this place as early as the Greek archaic period, so about the sixth century BCE, and they go all the way up to late antique and early Byzantine texts, so in the sixth to seventh century CE. These written sources include all kinds of genres from comedy, tragedy, history, geography, travel writing, and epic poetry. And they give us clues not only about activities that were actually taking place at Tyneron and features that could be found at the sanctuary in antiquity, but they also tell us about how and what people thought about this place, you know, its reputation across the Mediterranean, even if people had never been there. So this is where we get a lot of our doom and gloom, our forbidding and haunting imagery about a place that must be eerie if it's the end of the world. But sometimes the ancient writers get it wrong. As you can see, this is actually a pretty dry, sunny place. One Roman author, Hyginus, even calls Tyneron an island. So we always have to take our written sources with a pretty large grain of salt and ask ourselves not only who is writing that text, but who are they writing for and why. Other sources I look at carefully are the archeological remains like building foundations and pottery. While the site has never been extensively surveyed or excavated, small concentrated areas that were the focus of what we call rescue excavations can reveal pockets of activity that took place here, such as this mosaic floor that you're seeing. This is from a Hellenistic villa. We can imagine who lived here at the end of the world and why? Maybe a wealthy merchant who owned the nearby marble quarries? Maybe high-ranking officials involved with the daily activities of the sanctuary of Poseidon? 
We don't know the answers to this, but I plan to keep working here for a long time to hopefully find out the answers to questions in my future research. Another source I use is the landscape of Tyneron itself. The natural physical features of a place are so important to understanding how people lived and existed in that location. For example, there are no natural fresh water sources at Tyneron, so the entire landscape is dotted with cisterns, man-made reservoirs to collect and store water. The soil is also really shallow and rocky, so there aren't opportunities for large trees to take root or for agricultural exploita exploitation. So we need to think, how did anyone feed or shelter themselves here? I'm also really interested in how people move throughout spaces and places, especially on long journeys. And because Tyneron Sanctuary of Poseidon was a special place of refuge for asylum seekers, that would often mean a long, hot, overland journey down the Mani Peninsula to reach the safety of the sanctuary. For one of my projects, the Cartography Project, we digitally recreate journeys throughout the Mani Peninsula from antiquity all the way to the 20th century. And then we actually get on the ground and walk these routes ourselves to really try and understand what it would have been like for people moving through this rugged, mountainous, unforgiving landscape and where the best paths might have been. Lastly, I also look at epigraphic evidence, which is when you have stones inscribed with words. I'm gonna finish by showing you one example of epigraphy from Tyneron that can tell us about real people here in antiquity. How can this topic or material tell us about real people in the past? So I've already snuck in some real people content for you from the mercenaries to the marble merchants to the people who just walked around this landscape. But I wanna finish by telling you about some specific people who might've found themselves here at Tyneron thousands of years ago. At Tyneron, six inscriptions survive that contain information about manumitted individuals. So that's someone who has been enslaved and is being granted their freedom. All of these inscriptions are on stelae, which are upright stone slabs, and they actually would have been displayed in the sanctuary itself. Here, the archaeology and the epigraphy align really nicely because as you can see, the cuttings in the stone where these would have been installed in antiquity are still visible today. These manumissions are official documents that free douloi or privately enslaved persons rather than helots who were officially enslaved by and subsequently, if they were lucky, liberated by the Spartan state. All of these manumission documents follow a variation of the same formula. So you get an owner's name dedicated, a formerly enslaved person's name to Poseidon. And then you get an official's name and a witness's name. So this one, IGBI 1231, that's the official documentation number, the Inscriptiones Graeci inscription number, says Iscreon the Epirote dedicated Heraclitus and his effects to Poseidon. Ephor, Hegehistratos, Witnesses, Priaios, and Epikides. And this one dates anywhere from the middle of the 5th century BCE to the middle of the 4th century BCE. Two things are really interesting about this inscription. First, the inclusion of what we call an ethnic identifier. That's the word epirote. And this suggests that this person was from Epirus in Northern Greece. This gives us an idea of the sanctuary's importance beyond the immediate region of Laconia. People were intentionally traveling here from all over. It's also pretty cool because one of the witnesses, Priaios, likely a priest of Poseidon, is also named on a funerary stele found here. And he's named with his father, Aristoteles, and his brother, Darmenidas. And both his father and brother are in turn named as witnesses on other manumission stelae. So without these inscribed stones, we'd never know about these regular people. They aren't in the surviving literary sources, so the stones speak for them. And we're lucky to get a tiny bit of insight into what seems like a generational family tradition of serving as priests of Poseidon and as witnesses to the freeing of enslaved persons. But why would people travel here for manumission? Well, 
I think it has to do with its liminal geography, its remote and safe location, and the role that Tyneron played in antiquity as an important place of refuge. Throughout its known history as a sanctuary to Poseidon, Tyneron provided a safe haven and a neutral meeting place for helots, enslaved persons, castaways, defeated, and lost. For the helots, so again, that's the population enslaved by the ancient Spartans, Tyneron provided an appealing asylum away from Sparta and the Spartans, which made it worth the long, hot journey down the peninsula. And we also have some pretty famous historical figures who find themselves at Tyneron too, and they all happen to be seeking refuge from persecution or following decisive losses. So this includes the Spartan king Cleombrotos, who sought sanctuary within the Temple of Poseidon after being overthrown. An exiled Spartan king, Cleomenes, and his family, they march all the way down the Mani Peninsula to Tyneron before sailing to Egypt for protection. Cato the Younger, a Roman senator, stopped at Tyneron after his lost Julius Caesar in the Battle of Pharsalus to regroup on his way to the island of Kithara. And Mark Antony himself sailed directly to Tyneron after his devastating naval loss in the Battle of Actium. There's even a famous legendary tale of an everyday Kithara player named Arion of Methymna. He was thrown overboard by a crew of Corinthians sailing from Tarentum to Corinth. The story is full of greed and deceit and intrigue because the sailors, they steal Arian's prize money from a Kithra competition and they throw him overboard, leaving him for dead. But according to the tale, Arion was rescued by a dolphin who brought him back to Greece so that he could go to Corinth and eventually confront the sailors. But where does the dolphin bring Arion to Tyneron, nowhere near the coast of Corinth. No, the dolphin takes Arion to a place 200 kilometers from his destination. And while of course this story is fictional, the inclusion of Tyneron is important. To the ancient audiences hearing this story, just the mention of Tyneron itself for the listener automatically indicates that Arion is safe. So, where do you go when you have nowhere to turn? When you are a helot enslaved by the Spartan state whose very existence is considered expendable, where could you be safe? Or Marcus Antonius seeking overnight refuge after a devastating defeat at Actium, where does he go? Or a simple mythical fictional musician, Arion of Methymna, rescued from certain death by a dolphin, where does the legendary setting of this rescue conclude? Well, from the enslaved to the most famous? The answer is, of course, the end of the world. To be safe, you go to Tyneron. For more resources, videos, podcasts, and blogs, visit our website at peoplingthepast.com. Please follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at peoplingthepast. Thank you, as always, for watching. <laughs>